very, very uh, special day. I have finally managed to, to get one of my favorite uh, colleagues and members of our academy to join us in my In Conversation with series. Uh, Professor Abdul Karim, and I affectionately know you for many, many years as Slim, given sure. that we came from the same high school in Gandhi Desai, and you were like always ahead of me. So it's, it's, it's really, really great to have the, the singular pleasure of hosting you at an ASAF uh, meeting today. Um, colleagues joining us today, uh, Professor uh, Salim Abdul Karim is a household name now because he went from a star to a superstar and a super superstar in the last couple of years. Being that voice of reason and that calming voice that we all got used to during the COVID pandemic. And today he's not going to be talking exclusively on the COVID pandemic because as we all know, he is a, a scholar who represents science at the highest level of academic excellence, but he's also has a conscientious way of uh, being an activist. And it is this is what inspired me to invite him here today because this month of March, we celebrate uh, Human Rights Month. And at the time that I invited him, the world was a lot, much different space as opposed to what we've now been experiencing in the last two weeks or so. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. I just want to welcome all our participants joining us and Professor uh, Abdul Karim to this morning's uh, In Conversation with me, Himla Sudio, the Executive Officer of the Academy. Just a few words about Professor Karim. Uh, he's a clinical infectious uh, disease epidemiologist who has been widely acknowledged for his scientific contribution and leadership in the AIDS and more recently the COVID-19 pandemic. He is the director of CAPRISA and professor of global health at Columbia University. He's an adjunct professor at Cornell and Harvard University universities and the Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of KwaZulu Natal. He has served as president of the South African Medical Research uh, Council. We kind of overlapped a little bit while he was president and then he kicked me out. Um, <laughs> he, he was elected as a member of ASAF very early on in 2000 and has chaired the Academy's Standing Committee on Health and Related Studies and has been an active participant engaging in several ASAP related activities or activities that ASAP has promoted him or, or encouraged him to represent us on. So we're very, very grateful to you uh, giving us that support as you do unstintingly whenever called, about, called on. Currently, he also serves as a member on the WHO Science Council and the WHO TB HIV Task Force. He is vice president of the International Science Council and also a member of the Africa Commission on COVID-19 and the Lancet Commission on COVID-19. Professor Abdul Karim has many, 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 many other accolades that are deserving to be announced. But if I do that, we won't have the opportunity to engage with him. So Slim, welcome. And it is indeed a great, great privilege for us to have you here today. And, um, but just to kick us off, we would just like to hear, first and foremost, how you got into science and medicine. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so I was uh, pretty curious as a youngster, but it was really when I got to high school and uh, we went to the same high school, Gandhi Desai. Your mother was a teacher there. She, was one, she taught me as well. And, um, one of my high school teachers uh, by the name of Mr. Kasim Sidat uh, taught me physics and he just inspired me. He, he would challenge me, he would give me problems to solve uh, and so much so that I would meet him after school and we used to have a 15 to 20 minute slot with each other 
where he would bombard me with questions, whether it's, you know, Millikan oil drop experiment or, you know, uh, a Newtonian theory. And he, he, just, he just challenged me. And so I developed my love for science uh, because of his efforts. And I thank him to this day. Uh, went to visit him recently. He is now wheelchair bound, but he's still active. Mm. Um, and then uh, my maths teacher was superb, a person by the name of Mr. Hansraj. He really, you know, encouraged me to think in a particular way, in a very systematic way. But it was when I got to medical school that I uh, was influenced very heavily by my mentor, and that's Professor Jerry Kuvadia. So much so, uh, and I got to know Professor Kuvadia because we were both activists. And I was a student activist, and he was uh, in the Italian Congress. Um, but as a third year medical student, he asked me if I would like to do some research with him. And so that's what I did. I, I did my first research project, published my first paper as a third year medical student under Professor Kovadia's tutelage. And that paper up to this day, I mean, I, I'm so proud of it because yeah. yeah, it was my first paper and it was an analysis of how apartheid was impacting differential health status in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's called, I mean, it's a paper about uh, how do we understand race and health, basically. Okay. So it was, it was very much a political paper, but it was heavily scientific because it took a lot of time to work on it. Yeah, but anyway, so that's the history. Yeah, yeah. And, and growing up, I mean, in your family, um, you know, we all come from different uh, family backgrounds. Some of us were exposed to politics and the situation in South Africa. I mean, we all grew up during the apartheid era. But was the politics of the day ever discussed at your kitchen or dining room table? So my mother used to participate in uh, the ANC uh, rallies and marches and so on, because she stayed just down the road. Uh, she stayed in Savile Street and they would have, the ANC would have its meetings, uh, well, it wasn't ANC at that time, yeah. uh, but it, uh, it was a, a, variant, a variation of that. And it was largely trade unions that used to organize. And she used to participate in some of those things, but she was not overtly political. Mm -hmm. She just had a strong sense of what was right. Yeah. And uh, so she was not trying to fight uh, in an active way for some political party, but more, she wanted to do what was right. So we, you know, we were inculcated in that, in that. But it wasn't really until I went to medical school that I became very involved in politics. Yeah, I mean, you can't come to this medical school yes, and not, you know, because also you have to uh, think that I came to medical school and started medical school in 1978, just mm -hmm. shortly after Steve Biko, who yes. was a medical student here, had just been killed uh, by the apartheid security police. So it's against that backdrop that I came to this medical school. Mm -hmm. And if you just take my medical school class, yes. and class of 1978, we, we graduated in 1983. Yes. In my class was the, uh, the class monitor, the class uh, representative was Dr. Aaron Motswaledi, who's mm -hmm. currently our Minister of Home Affairs. Uh, also in our class was Dr. Joe Parshla, our current Minister of Health. Mm -hmm. um, Another member of our class was Dr. Sibong, uh, 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 what is his name, Dr. Quere, who okay. used to be the Minister of Spies under, okay. uh, under uh, President Zuma. 
Yeah, he was the one whose wife was found to have been dealing in drugs and so on. Right. Siabonga, clearly. Siabonga. That's, yeah. So, I mean, these were all, you know, so just from one class, we had three ministers. In, right. It just gives you some idea. And of course, many people in my class were very active in politics. Yeah. I think for me, the highlight of my life. Uh, and I consider this one of the great highlights, not, not a political highlight, but a highlight yeah. of my life, was uh, when I was a medical student, I, uh, I was a junior intern and I asked my consultant if I could go to Cape Town. I was uh, uh, elected as a delegate to the mm -hmm. launch of a new political organization called the United Democratic Front. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went to Cape Town as a okay. young medical student and was a delegate attended the launch of mm -hmm. the UDF. And for me, sitting in Mitchell's plane in that venue, yeah. and it was packed to the rafters. Right? We were yeah. All of it, I mean, we were hanging out of any space there was. Yes. And we listened to uh, the Reverend Alan Busak. Mm -hmm. That man, he, he had us in the palm of his hands. Right. What a powerful orator. Wow. I mean, I, I felt moved by that occasion. And it, it forever will remain with me that I was there when the UDF yes. was created. Yes. Oh, that's so, I mean, I'm feeling like that goosebumps because as you're saying that, I'm trying to pick what my turning point moment was also influenced by others but it's not about me it's about you you now have almost you know four decades of exposure uh, from apartheid to the post-democratic era and we are celebrating human rights month and human rights day on the 21st of this month what does human rights mean to you with this collective experience engagements at different levels, both in your science, in the space of, uh, uh, you know, the social dynamics and the political arena, both locally and internationally. What does human rights mean to Abdul Karim? So I think uh, when, I, when I reflect on the use of power, when I reflect on the relationship between any two individuals and the imbalance that exists in the power differential between any two individuals or any individual and an organization, I have a sense of that there has to be a, a, a fundamental belief system that guides that interaction. Mm -hmm. And to me, the principle of human rights is about ensuring that we can express free will. And the way in which we express that free will has to come with responsibilities. So uh -huh. it's not unfettered. And right. in fact, it's made very clear in our own Bill of Rights, in our own constitution, that any one of our rights is dependent on other rights. And you can't, you can't just go and murder somebody because you, that's your free will. It, it impinges that person's rights. So how we understand rights has to be within the context of our society, our responsibilities, and the importance that individuals are given the leeway to express themselves as we do in a democratic society. Now, I'm involved in many human rights organizations, but one of them is Physicians for Human Rights. They won the Nobel Prize yes. uh, on nuclear war. And in serving on the committee for the advisory committee on for Physicians for Human Rights, which is based in New York, we reflect on many issues. But fundamentally, we are reflecting and taking a stand on how 
society and institutions within society that hold power, how do they relate to healthcare workers? And how do they protect and promote the right of rights of healthcare workers and doctors? And right now, we've just put out a statement on Ukraine, which just points out that, you know, within what is going on in Ukraine, healthcare workers yeah. uh, are supposed to be neutral and protected under the Geneva yeah, Convention. Yeah. But Russia is targeting them. Russia is targeting uh, you know, uh, nuclear power stations, but it's also targeting hospitals. Indiscriminate use of missiles into civilian areas is impacting hospitals yeah. uh, and healthcare workers. So we have to take a stand because a health worker impacted in this way in Ukraine today, yeah. you know, tomorrow it'll be in South Africa or anywhere else in the world. We have to ensure that those rights are protected. So as I see it, human rights for me yeah. ensures that we have a mechanism and a way to serve our society in a way in which we respect everyone and we respect their will and we work with those uh, responsibilities that come with those rights. Wow, I, I, I mean, fascinating, fascinating. Now, on that issue uh, relating to healthcare, <clears throat> tell us a little bit about this journey, this controversial journey you've had with the whole HIV and AIDS scenario in South Africa. Well, I, I, I've said uh, on a few occasions that when I do write my memoirs, uh, you can be assured there's a whole chapter dedicated to it because it was in many ways surreal. So I was um, uh, involved in HIV right from the start. Um, mm -hmm. I, I gave my first lecture on HIV because I was a lecturer, uh, a registrar training in virology at the time at the medical school here. And this goes back to 1984-85 when I started working on my PhD on hepatitis B. <laughs> but um, when you think about HIV and you think about the controversies around it, there are so many parallels to what we are dealing with in COVID. I'll give you two examples. The first was in HIV, there was a whole group of people who argued that HIV was actually created by the US CDC and that they put it into the polio vaccine and they went into West Africa and they injected it into Africans. And so HIV is actually an American conspiracy to exterminate the Africans and that it backfired. So that's how HIV impacted the US in such a devastating way. So that's the theory. There's a book written about it, by the way, called The River. So it's not, this is not just a loony fringe. There are a whole lot of people who believe this and the evidence stacked up. So what was the evidence? Well, the US CDC had African green monkeys that they were doing experiments on. It still does. Yeah. That they had stocks of the simian immunodeficiency virus that HIV is thought to emanate from. They even showed that the CDC bought reagents that would wow. enable them to change the virus and to change its uh, RNA structure. And I mean, I could go on, right? Uh, about, because, you know, the CDC played a key role in the polio immunization programs in West Africa. So you join circumstantial evidence, you join them and make the dots come together. And what you create, you create a conspiracy. Mm. And the more you try to challenge the conspiracy, the more the views harden that this conspiracy must be right. 
So yes. you can't win when you're arguing with people on a conspiracy theory. And we're facing exactly the same problem now. Yes. There's a whole group of people who believe that the University of North Carolina, together with an organization called EcoHealth in the US, got funding from US military or the US NIH and worked with the Wuhan Institute of Virology to actually create this virus from the original SARS. And that they either deliberately released it from the lab or yeah. accidentally it leaked from the lab. Yeah. So, and you know, there are many dots you can join. Like the way I just outlined it for HIV, you can join dots like that for COVID. The answer yeah. is yes, there was a project. That project involved these organizations. They've been doing it for quite a while. They were doing gain of function studies with SARS, but nowhere is there any evidence that they actually made a virus like this. And it would be amazing if they actually made it because Imagine if you could make a virus like this, it would be yeah, something yeah. else. So yeah. Yeah. I've had to deal with these conspiracy theories. It gets even more complicated if you mm -hmm. take uh, the second example I'd like to use is that uh, there were individuals, and I won't mention any names, that believed that HIV did not cause AIDS. Now, some of them, are eminent scientists. I'll give you the example of Peter Duesberg. Peter yeah. Duesberg from the University in, San, in California, San Francisco, he is an eminent scientist. I mean, whose work on oncogenes, I know very well. So a highly respected scientist who simply did not accept that HIV caused AIDS. He, ex he accepted that HIV exists. It wasn't, it wasn't a problem, but he wouldn't accept that it caused a AIDS. He believed yeah. that AIDS was caused by something else, if it, if it even existed. Um, so you have to now sit and argue with people like that. And I had to do that in the Becky presidential panel was they were, you know, the panel was set up with 16 uh, denialists and 16 of us who, uh, you know, accepted that HIV caused AIDS. There were four South Africans in the panel, one on the denialist side, uh, a professor of family medicine from Medunsa, and there were three of us on the orthodox side, Professor Mahoba, Professor Prozeski, and myself, all three of us from the MRC. That committee, after it met the first time, was expanded subsequently to include many other scientists in South Africa. Yeah. But that's how we started this debate. And the more you explain to them, the basic elements of the science that show that HIV causes AIDS, the more they were convinced that you were wrong and the more they, they think it's a conspiracy. I mean, I'm dealing with exactly that same issue now. Yeah. Now it's about denialism of vaccines. Mm -hmm. It's denying that vaccines are of benefit and all kinds of conspiracy theories about how Mr. Gates He's sitting in his office in Seattle and he's putting <laughs> microchips into the vaccine so that yeah. he'll know where you are. He can track you and, and he can control you. And I mean, you just name it and how mRNA is going to interfere with your DNA and cause you to be sterile and impotent. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I, I deal with all of the same kind <laughs> nonsensical conspiracy theories in in COVID, just like how I had to deal with them in HIV. Yeah, I mean, the parallels are, are just uh, fascinating. But, but why is it that denialists seem to have a platform from which to launch and they get such a lot of support from social media? I mean, if you see, Sometimes the NICD will put out, you know, the daily numbers for COVID, etc. And there'll be 400 odd nonsense stuff that people would respond. How is it? I suppose when you can hide behind these sorts of uh, tweets and Facebook and other kinds of social media things, you know, you, you feel like you have a license to say what you want to. But given that we have such a strong scientific ethos, 
uh, and I mean, especially with with COVID, because I think with the COVID pandemic, we were much more engaged. And thanks to people like yourselves, who took the 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 complexity of the science and microchipped it, and and gave us sound bites, so that you know everyone around that lounge sitting and watching you on being interviewed understood. And I mean, I still say the first uh, meeting the department hosted with you, where you broke down the science, I think for me, that was an epic uh, uh, positioning of science engagement and science communication. I mean, that stood out. And I've written to you to congratulate you and tell you what that meant. But why is it that we have this, such a powerful voice of science? But yet the, the opposition seems to have the loudest clout and voice. Well, you know, the beauty of democracy is that we can disagree. <laughs> and, and that we, we protect the rights of people who disagree. And that we don't have to agree on everything. And in the case of COVID, that is the single most important predictor of how well a country has done. The more a country has focused on the collective good, where people act not just for their own benefit, but for the benefit of society and their fellow human beings, the better the country has done. And that's across the board. And I've participated in many panels and committees and yeah. commissions looking at this issue. So if you take right now, the strongest predictor of mm -hmm. whether you are anti-vax in the US is your political affiliation. So Republicans, if you are a Republican, it is the strongest predictor of whether you are anti-vax or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what has happened is that the anti-vax movement in the US has become very closely aligned with right-wing viewpoints that are intermingled with white supremacy, with anti-abortion, yeah. with a whole range of positions that are on the right end of the spectrum in terms of politics. So it's become politically partisan. And in, in the rest of the world, we have seen similar tendencies. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying all anti-vaxxers are white supremacists. No, right. far from it. But there is a fair number of individuals who are anti-vax who are also at the right end of the spectrum in terms of politics. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many people on the right end of the spectrum who are still, you know, believe in vaccines. So it's not a, 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 I'm not painting anyone with any brush. But if we look at uh, this particular group of people who do not believe or do not accept that vaccines protect against HIV, uh, against um, COVID-19 and so on, there is a very strong relationship with social media. Mm -hmm. Now, in uncurated, forms of mass communication, people can say any nonsense and yeah. it is equal to anything else that is said. So it doesn't matter what you say, yeah. it has an equal voice. And in fact, in many instances, it has a louder voice because in, in, in many of these instances, they become like echo chambers. <laughs> One person sends it to another, that person sends it to all their person, they, then they, so they, they echo it. And right. it's this group that's echoing it, that's creating this buzz mm -hmm. that, oh, the vaccines are bad. Oh, did you hear that this person died after taking the vaccine in this country, in Canada? And I mean, just all kinds of things that get, that explode in this way, but they yeah. don't actually get into the regular media. Yes. And because they just, they're not facts. Yes. They are yeah. suppositions and they are often fake news. 
And so when you read the regular media, you don't see those things. They are, yeah. they are confined to the social media. And so the social people who are part of this echo chamber, they see it as a conspiracy that the, you know, the media is, is suppressing all this important information that do yeah. you know that there's a secret file that the FDA has about thousands of terrible side effects of the Pfizer vaccine. And yeah. I mean, they, 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 the things they, they dream do. up, yeah. and like any good conspiracy, mm. the usual a kernel of truth in yes. it, just yeah. enough to make it sound that it's, there's some level of genuineness to it. But yes. it's a complete distortion of the truth that's yeah. actually being portrayed. And I deal with that all the time. And to me, perhaps one of the weirdest things, and I can't understand this, mm. but it's true in the US, it is true in Europe, and it's true in South Africa, and it's now also true in places like Australia, is mm. that individuals who are against vaccines, who believe yeah. that vaccines are some kind of conspiracy, yeah. they are very strongly pro-ivermectin, which uh -huh. is a worm medicine used <laughs> for river blindness, and yeah. it's used to feed worms in horses and cows and so on. Yeah. Uh, and they are big believers that ivermectin yeah. works, even though there are now several clinical trials that show yeah. that it does not have any benefit. So the same people who, who ignore the clinical trials that show that vaccines have great benefits, mm -hmm. they ignore the trials that show that ivermectin is harmful or not even harmful, but that doesn't have any benefit. So it, it, is, it, it, it beggars belief. Yeah. That, that people uh, would put their conspiracies ahead of the evidence that hitting them right in their face. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's, that's amazing that the two kind of go in opposite ways. Uh, colleagues, we have disabled the chat because we had noted in the previous webinar that people were posting things in the chats and it became very disruptive to uh, you know, the, the speakers. But I think we still have the Q&A uh, active. So if you have any questions for Prof Karim, I'm gonna open it up in a short while. So please post it in there and my colleague Renata will highlight uh, some of your, your questions and I will be happy to pose that to Prof Karim. Coming back to the issue of human rights, I mean, you did touch on it when you, when you responded to one of my questions, but I'd like uh, you to, to answer this to get it uh, in this conversation. I was privileged to have listened uh, to both you and Edward Cameron when you were being interviewed and spoke on one of the webinars hosted by the Daily Maverick. And there was a very, good uh, engagement between the two of you, both being activists uh, and, you know, having had your own experiences with the HIV AIDS scenario. But the issue I want to, to, for you to just clarify out of the previous response that you gave is how do we balance the rights of individuals or individual rights, particularly those who do not want to be vaccinated and the right to protect the majority in which that environment of all individuals are. So, so I just want to bring us back to the, 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 you know, the, the expectation from the call of government for all of us to be vaccinated and those who claim they do not want to be vaccinated because they are exercising their individual rights. So I think that um, most individuals who argue that they have the right to bodily integrity uh, and therefore should not, cannot be compelled and should not be compelled to take a vaccine. I think that uh, that is well enshrined in our constitution that 
you do have that right to bodily integrity. Um, but it is not an unqualified right. It yeah. is not a right that uh, is so cast in stone that nothing can move it. It is a right that has to be uh, balanced with other rights. Mm. And let me give you an example. That one of the other rights is the right to life. This is the right to life. Now, if I am, as I am, an elderly person, I wouldn't call me elderly. Let's just, let's just say, I'll talk about somebody else. Who's you can get a Sasa grant. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let, let's, for argument's sake, say the following. That here we have a 75-year-old grandmother. And she is traveling in a taxi, a minibus taxi with you. And you, as a young person, let's say 30-year-old, you've chosen not to get vaccinated. You want to protect your right to bodily integrity. And it happens that in your protecting your right, you haven't been vaccinated. And quite coincidentally, you happen to get infected because Omicron is so infectious, you picked it up. Yes. And that when you picked it up, the vast majority of the transmissions that occur, yeah. occur before you get symptoms. Yeah. What is called pre-symptomatic spread. So you don't know you have this virus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You now sit in the minibus taxi next to this grandmother. And in the course of that, you infect her. In infecting her because of her age, yes. she gets very severely ill. And let's for argument's sake say she dies, which she has a high risk of dying, by the way, at that age. Yeah. So now your right to bodily integrity has impacted her right to life. Yes. So you we now have to weigh that up. Yeah. And fortunately, in South Africa, we have a constitutional court that has a mandate to weigh yeah. up, in terms of the constitutions, all our, our constitution to weigh up our rights so that we can make a judgment about how we temper rights when they impinge on others' rights. And in my view, there is little question that individuals who choose not to get vaccinated, that their rights and their individual beliefs and rights have to end or be tempered at the point at which it's now impacting other people's rights and is now no longer allowing them to enjoy rights that they uh, have inherently. In that particular case that I argued, let's, let's turn that into, uh, so what if this person was vaccinated? Mm -hmm. The answer to that question is, yes, if you're vaccinated, you still have a risk of getting infected because no vaccine is 100% protective. And as we saw with Delta variant and the Omicron variant, there are still a reasonable risk of getting breakthrough infections. But when you get a breakthrough infection, when you've been vaccinated, the risk that you transmit it mm -hmm. to someone else is significantly lower. How okay. much lower? Well, a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few days ago, quantifies that. If you have taken two doses of the Pfizer vaccine mm -hmm. and you get infected, yep. you reduce the risk 
of spreading the virus to yeah. household contacts, contacts in close quarters like uh, transport, contacts at events, and mm -hmm. contacts in office contacts. Yeah. You reduce your risk of transmitting this virus by 68%. Yo. So now, a 75-year-old sitting next to you, if you were vaccinated and you did get a breakthrough infection, she now carries a much lower risk that she would get infected. So yeah. in my view, you could have taken an action that would have protected her right to life. And right. you chose not to do that. <laughs> yeah. Look, I'm, I'm tempted. I've got a zillion questions floating in my head to ask you on COVID, but <clears throat> that's not a reason why I ask you. I want us to focus on the yeah. human aspect, given that we're celebrating that. And you'd see, I've kind of uh, tailored my questions to you around that issue. <clears throat> um, one of my colleagues uh, said that I should ask you this. And uh, she said, and then I'm just going to quote, we are born without asking for it. What are we entitled to? And the second part of her comment was, how can we ensure dignity for all human beings, for all living creatures, and for our environment? That's a very profound question. I don't know if I have a profound answer to it, but perhaps for me, at its simplest, is that we have been born into an era of society where individual benefit and individual competition and individualism has been placed as the paramount goal in our society and particularly the accumulation of individual wealth. So what has happened is that we have been born into an era and a society, particularly in the post-Cold War uh, period, mm -hmm. where the world and large parts of the world are driven by this need for individualism or driven yeah. by the, the, the giving priority to individuals. Now, we as a society were not really built on those principles because if you take uh, just South Africa, and I think Madiba spelt it out for us in a no uncertain terms when he talked about Ubuntu, that we exist because of who we are and who we are with, that we are all part and parcel of our society and our actions should not only be devoted to what is good for us, but also what is good for us as a society, as a community, as a collective. Yeah. Now, in my view, one of the exemplary examples, uh, one of the examples that's really strong, that illustrates this, is Stockfels. So, yeah. And you know, Stockfels were really a way of life until recently. And now it's much less common, but in Stockfels, you have, let's say, 12 families. And those 12 families agree every month that they will set aside a fixed amount. And that fixed amount goes to uh, a pot that is allocated to each of the 12 families each month. So that means once a year, you have all 12 amounts available to you. Mm -hmm. So you can go and buy that washing machine or <laughs> that, you know, that appliance or something that you would not otherwise be able to afford. It's, right. it's how you develop your capital, that you can't do so on your own, but because yeah. of your collectivism, 
you build your capital. And that not just builds financial capital, it builds social capital. Because you now have to trust 11 other families that when they get their money, they're not going to stop. And so when it gets to you, you're going to have no money left. So there is a fundamental uh, mechanism that's involved in such an activity that builds social cohesion, that builds the belief that my actions are not just about me and my hedonism, but it's about us as a society advancing. It's about Mm -hmm. us as a collective. And I feel we've lost our way in that regard in South Africa. We've lost our way because Mm -hmm. corruption is the antithesis of that collectivism, that belief that the greater good is important. That corruption is about a personal accumulation of wealth through illegal means. Yeah. And that, that personal accumulation is, and that's why it really hurts when we see that individuals are stealing money that belongs to poor people. Yeah. And when you take VBS, those are poor people's money that these people stole. It's, I mean, you think about all those executives in VBS Bank that stole all those millions. Mm. That's poor people's money. It's not, not people who could just afford to lose that money. They live on that. That is their livelihoods. So to me, corruption exemplifies how much we have lost our way in our country. That we, yeah. have, we have changed yeah. our priority that we have lost our way and we are now in in a mode where all we want is what is good for me. And no one says it better in my view than Donald Trump when he says, me first. (laughs) That's his, his, his fundamental philosophy. And yeah. he's exactly in the same way, you know, he, he, he's, he, he has all these corrupt dealings in his uh, property deals because it's about me first. He wants the levels of power to benefit him and his little quarter at best. But he on, cares on, on, about On that system. point, uh, Slim, uh, I mean, what, what are... Uh, you know, uh, uh, forebears and and our great icons of the apartheid anti-apartheid movement have fought for for us to have democracy in this country, to the point of where we see the state of our country today. What are your comments on on the things that you you would say? I am proud to be a South African, and On the other side, you could say, like you've just said about corruption, you know what, this really, really galls me. But I want you to answer this again in the flavor of our human rights, because that's our constitution, right? That's our go-to to to understand who we as a society would like to be. Mm -hmm. It's a great constitution, but we move away from that in many aspects of the way we live our lives and our lived experiences. So from a personal touch without compromising you, I mean, we're having an open discussion here. Sure. Uh, sure. What, what is our scorecard in terms of how we have progressed or regressed as a society at large with respect to our constitutional rights as expressed in our constitution? So I think I've, uh, I've given the negative side, but let me tell you that we live in a great country with great people, with wonderful people. And it's the reason why I live in South Africa. I could choose to live anywhere. Mm. I chose to yeah. live here. 
And I have chosen this place because I am so enamored with who we are. Because when I listen to Zondo, that's not who we are. That's not who we are. There's a group of people who are exploiting conditions for the personal gain, but that's not who we are as a country, as a people. We are a country that cares. We care about each other. We care that we want to do what is good. And when I look at that, I mean, I'll give you, I mean, I could give you many examples, yeah. but when I think back, let me give you a COVID example that I've used before. Mm. I look at, we knew in April of 2020 yeah. that we were gonna witness a wave of yeah. infection. We expected that we would be impacted like we saw in Italy, like we saw in New York, patients are dying in the car parks, they can't get into hospitals, there isn't enough beds, there isn't enough oxygen. And so we put in place the effort to try and slow down the infections or what we call flattening the curve to buy us a bit of time. So let's look at what was done with that time. Well, many things were done, and I won't go into the detail, but let me give you one example of something that was done. The Cape Town ICC mm. was converted into an 800-bed hospital with oxygen at every bed. It even included an ICU section. For me, if you had asked any person what would it take to build an 800 bed hospital in the ICC? They would say, yeah, it can be done. It'll take us about five years, yeah. 10 years, maybe. You know, hospitals are very complex structures. You have to have patients come in, you have to have infection control, you've got to feed them. I mean, just think about the medicines and all of that. And then you've got to have oxygen. So ask me, I would have said, yeah, it'll take us a few years to do it. Yeah. They built it in six weeks. Yeah. Whoever did it, it is an yeah. exemplar of how powerful we are when we put our minds to our task. We can achieve great things and we can do so because we put our shoulder to the wheel. I mean, I look at every week organizations doing amazing things yeah. and whether they are NGOs or whether it's government or whether it's the private sector, you know, whether it's Imtia Suleiman with his trucks, it doesn't matter. We as South Africans, we do great things. And I'm mm. proud. I'm proud to be yeah. here. I'm not, I'm, I don't look at, at all this corruption and nonsense and say, oh, I'm, you know, I don't like this country. I yeah. say, those are people who are trying to drag us down. Yeah. But they can't drag us down because we as a people are stronger than that. Sure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, that's, that's very good because what you're highlighting is that, you know, we, we fuel our outlook on life on the negativity, but yet we do not internalize the good to give us that positive outlook. And I think the more we focus on the latter, you know what I call the feel good gene, you know, as a geneticist, I say, if beans and roti does it for me and religion or whatever for somebody else, that, that space of inner peace that you have with yourself, it, it's such a good, I mean, mold to, mm -hmm. to give you that positive outlook, you know, going yeah. to, to take on life in general, because not all of us, we're born with a golden spoon in our mouths that we we're entitled. We've all worked very, very hard to, you know, to be yeah. where we are. But yet there's a vast majority of our brother and sister that that are not as privileged. And so the, you know that right of human solidarity, the right to life and the right to to be able to live in a society 
that is functional and that you don't have to struggle is what we should aspire to. Uh, one of my colleagues has asked on the Q&A, thanks you for a very eloquent uh, discussion. And uh, the question is, where to next for you? What are your ambitions at this stage of your career? Ah, oh, that's not an easy question. Um, I have uh, seen it as my responsibility uh, to, to be part and parcel of the global response to infectious diseases. And I play that role in multiple fora. So, and so people say, you know, but you, why you left the Ministerial Advisory Committee and why have you ditched us? I didn't ditch anything. I, I have to move on because I can play a more constructive role on the whole continent. I can play a more constructive role at a global level. And that's what I've been doing. And I've been doing so through a range of different mechanisms. I mean, if you just take, you know, what my day looked like yesterday, I had, you know, four major Zoom meetings with people from all over the world. And I'm sharing with them a whole new perspective about how we need to think about the use of evidence in our response to infectious diseases. Um, and, you know, for example, yesterday at 5.30, I had a call on the Lancet Commission on HIV uh, in, in big cities. So it's not just about COVID because COVID is just here today, but we have to think about, we've got three major pandemics we're dealing with in our country and in the world, HIV, TB, and uh, COVID. And in many countries, you have to add malaria to that as well. So in my view, we, I, I feel, not my view, I feel I have a bigger role to play and I make myself available in that way. Now, one of the things I do is I generate what is called epidemic intelligence where I am looking at all of the available information I can lay my hands on. And I'm trying to understand what that means for action. How can that information be converted in a way that it's useful? So one of the things I do, I put out uh, a weekly email. I've been doing that since the middle of 2020. It goes to a whole lot of people across the world. It, it, you know, it, it, uh, it goes to the uh, uh, scientific committee advising the New Zealand government on COVID-19. It goes to the entire committee in the UK, the SAGE. It goes to the Canadian committee on COVID-19. It goes to a whole lot of places. But it misses me. I don't get it. You got well, to ask you gotta just ask. I, I, you I make it available. Remember that ASAP is your first house after your family home. <laughs> you got to send it to me so that we could invigorate our right. society as well. So don't forget, if there's one thing you do today, is that you add me to that mailing add list. Add you to the list. But I think for me, it's about using my experience. Because that's, I mean... I'm no brighter than anyone else. I just have the ability to use my vast experience yeah. in having dealt with HIV for almost 40 years and mm -hmm. you know, dealing with TB. I started off, I did my first investigation of a measles outbreak back in 1980s, in the early 80s. You know, I, I chaired our, cover, our government's polio expert committee. So, I've got all that wealth of experience. And that wealth of experience now needs to be, I need to pay back. The yeah. world has given me that opportunity. This is my opportunity to pay back. And I'll, I'll pay back in yeah. as broad a way to maximize my impact. No, and I mean, we see that, we see that. I know we've hit the time, but could I engage you for another five more minutes? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. 
Uh, uh, Babette Ravi, who we know very well, has asked a very good question, and it's uh, how do we manage the ethical conflict of a medical practitioner who faces a patient that requests a letter of exemption from vaccination based on medical concerns, where these are real concerns based on the person's medical history. This uncertainty, uncertainty complicates judgment of the rights of the person versus the rights of others. So I know you touched on that question before yeah. this particular context. Would you like to provide some response? Sure. No, I'd be very happy to do that. In my life, I have been faced on multiple occasions with having to make decisions that faced two alternatives. The one was the difficult road, mm -hmm. but that's the road that is justifiable. Yeah. It's the road based on principle. And the second is the easier road. It's yeah. the road built on expediency. Now, when you, when you tread down the road of expediency, let me tell you, it's a slippery slope. Uh -huh. Because once you enter that road, all you find is expediency. Right. And then you have no principles, you have no pillar by which you guide yourself. Because you go with the wind. Today yeah. it's this, tomorrow it's that. And if you, uh, 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 if you take that road and lose your spine, you lose your backbone and you wave, yeah. wave based on the pressure of the day. Yeah. There's no going back. Mm. And that's, that's what was the strength of many great people, whether it's Mandela or Mahatma Gandhi, they stood on principle, even when it was not expedient, right. even when it meant they had to go to jail, even when it meant that they suffered as a result, they stood on principle because they believed in what they were doing was right. So yeah. use that. I'm not going to tell you what to do because it would be pointless. Yes. You have to come to that realization yourself. And yes. it's, it's in you. It's, yeah. it's in you. And you yeah. have to make that decision because whatever that decision is, it is a decision that lays a path down yes. the line. And I yes. see that all the time because... Now, one day, you are asked to defend your decision. Right. And all you will do, you will now make stories. Right? Yeah. You will conjure up stories to try and justify it. Yeah. You know, you, you, you'll sound a bit like, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Maybe our current minister of science, uh, no, current minister of energy, trying mm -hmm. to justify the expansion and the use of coal. There's no, there's no justification for it. The right. whole world is moving away yeah. from coal. That, that our minister wants to move us in the direction of maintaining coal is just nonsensical. And yeah. he's doing so not as a matter of principle, because as a matter of principle, we are committed to the Paris Accord. We are committed mm. to dealing with climate change. We are committed to mitigating climate change. And our commitment to mitigating coal and fossil fuels and the diminishing reliance on that is a critical part of it. Yeah. So make that decision based on expediency. Today, it's about coal workers. I don't want them to lose their jobs. Now, you're not making a decision on yeah. principle. You're making right. a decision on expediency. And once you go down that road, it's a very difficult road to come back out of. Oh, that's very sound advice. Um, Prof, also, you may have heard that uh, this year, 2022, has been proclaimed by the United Nations as the International Year for Basic Sciences and Sustainable Development. Uh, what are your thoughts on how do we convince the general public of the importance of basic sciences to make our world more sustainable? Because the other part is, one part is about basic sciences and the other one is on uh, the sustainable development goals. I think COVID has kind of just put us on 
you know, on that fork that we went into the COVID pandemic and we and, and we haven't kept the, the the resonance onto the sustainable development goals. So so what kind of advice would you tell us, our colleagues on this uh, on this webinar on how to stay focused on using science, the basic sciences for the advancement of uh, sustainable uh, projects linked with the sustainable development goals. And again, human rights and health and everything fall into that. What are your thoughts? I would be calling on you at some point again for this uh, topic. We have a year for it. The launch is happening on the 8th of July by the UNESCO Secretariat. And there will be a bit of a focus on this at the World Science Forum that South Africa is hosting at the end of the year. But just, yeah. just a thought on it uh, before. Yeah. I'm not sure whether there's something inherent in us that we uh, will sometimes put others down. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this in many fora where you know, for example, clinical scientists will put down social scientists yes. or they will put down, you know, uh, public health scientists or epidemiologists and basic scientists will put somebody else down and somebody will put basic scientists down. That, that there's an inherent uh, perspective that we need to put others down to feel more important. It's a very sad reality when we come to that, because all science is important. All science is equally important. Whether you are a psychologist, whether you are an anthropologist, or whether you're a nuclear scientist, or a agronomist, or clinician, it doesn't matter. Your task is to build new knowledge, is yeah. to create the, the fundamentals that enable us as a society to advance. And how do we advance? We advance on the basis of new knowledge. That new knowledge comes from us, all of us as scientists. We have to find a way to acknowledge who we are, Yes. And we need to focus on our own excellence and that we stand on the basis of our excellence, that we don't need to put others down to make us feel important, <laughs> that yeah. we feel important because we're making a contribution. We're making yeah. a contribution because what we're doing is excellent. So in my view, if we strive for excellence, mm. no matter what discipline we are in, Yes. We can hold our heads up high and just feel sorry for that poor idiot who feels <laughs> he needs to press somebody else down to feel like he's taller. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you said the taller one because you know I'm height disadvantaged. <laughs> um, this has been a fascinating discussion and I mean, I don't know where the time went and I'm I'm glad we didn't have a presentation as we normally do because it gave us an opportunity to, to engage. You know, this has been a non-rehearsed uh, dialogue, but I want to ask you one final question before I let you go. Sure. We know how busy you are and you have an illustrious career sitting on many, many, many committees. You're running uh, a, a big uh, uh, Caprisa. And yet you have a family who are equally uh, um, visible in their individual spaces. I mean, we, I mean, I know Karisha very well and I know she works well with you and we, you know, we are so proud of her achievements as well. And as we are of your, your daughters, I don't know too much about your son, but I know a lot more about your daughters. How do you find time to balance this commitment, this unstinting contribution that you make to the sciences, but to keep such a well-balanced family together? I'm not sure I keep it together as much as anything that Croatia does, because she's really the glue that keeps all of us together, the matriarch. <laughs> but I will say that 
I I don't know if I've done anything right in in my life that uh, you know uh, makes us particularly stand out as a family. Uh, I would say that each person is their own own person. Each 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 member of my family, they are individuals in their own right. That they yeah. we happen to be related is just by the by biological genetic. Yeah. Say and the word take, genetic. Genetic. Okay, you say genetic. <laughs> but if you take, I mean, you take my organization that yeah. Croatia and I run, Caprisa, we are 81% women in Caprisa. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the, at the top echelons of Caprisa, it's almost all women. If you just take me out of, if I get knocked over by a bus, it's pretty much all women. And, you know, the head of statistics at Caprisa, you know, is a woman. The head of treatment research is a woman. So they are all, I mean, women run this organization. And I feel as a society, we only really are half as good, if, if that at all, if we don't acknowledge and give women the opportunity to rise and to achieve their potential. And in my two daughters, I have just seen how they have used their own talents to rise and they are their own people. I feel uh, for myself, the one advantage I have had is that I sleep very little. You know, I go to bed at one, two in the morning, 2.30, I'm up by six in the morning, so I only need a very short amount of sleep. So I have a lot of time on my side. And that time is what I can spend, you know, doing my research, being with my family. And we've had a very strict rule throughout our lives. And it was actually came from my own family. My mother had that rule. You're not allowed to eat dinner on your own. You have to, dinner is a dinner time and you are expected to be at the table when everyone else is having dinner. This thing about you take a plate and go somewhere. No, 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 that was not allowed. She took the day to cook dinner. You sat down and you ate dinner and we would all chat about what happened in the day. We talk about Ukraine. We talk about whatever it is. Mm. You know, my, my daughters just came and spent the weekend with us last yeah. weekend. And it was just amazing just to sit and chat and catch up and so on. So I feel we don't do that enough. Yeah. We don't find each other as human beings, mm. not as father and daughter, not a, but just yeah. find each other as human beings. That's all I can say. Yeah. No, uh, that's, 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 that's wonderful. Um, uh, Slum, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for agreeing. I know how busy you are. And I think you, you were uh, a suitable choice for us to celebrate uh, this month's uh, Human Rights Month. Uh, I know you are traveling soon and I wish you well. And thank you again for uh, managing your diary to accommodate us this way. There are many, many other questions I could have asked you on, you know, COVID and HIV. And I think in some of the responses, you, you, you uh, extrapolated on that, like with some of the questions that have come up on the Q&A. Uh, so, so thank you very much. And we wish you well. And uh, we also are very proud to have you as one of the, you know, the founding people who got uh, ASAP going. Please remember us and always uh, be there to support us because, I mean, not just yourself, Karisha and many, many other stalwarts have really positioned uh, what evidence-based science means in terms of advancing society. Uh, and yes, we are living currently in a very politically fueled space with the situation uh, in, in the Ukraine and Russia. And, uh, you know, we, we sympathize with all. I mean, you just said what it means to have everybody around the dinner table. And, and we don't think that things like war and stuff should happen in this 
day and age uh, because it's lives. It's special. We, we, we want to support life and we want to support the advancement of life and all linkages with it. Uh, and that's, that's part and parcel of our human rights. And uh, in closing, I just want to thank everybody for giving us the time to join us. And thank you once again for a few extra minutes to, to, to have this wonderful conversation. We've recorded it. It will be on our social media spaces. So um, all the best to you. And uh, thanks again to one and all. All the best. Bye for now. Take care. Bye. Cheers.